Hey there, horror movie tea sippers. The following podcast will contain spoilers for the movie we are about to review. If you have not seen the movie and do not wish to have anything ruined prematurely, then please do not continue to listen until after you have seen the movie. And welcome to the Horror Movie Tea Podcast. At long last, we are finally covering <laughs> The Grudge from 2004, which is the American remake of Juwan, which we covered back in our Asian Horror Movie Month. Or was that before? It was before. Okay. But anyways, because we've, we've already covered the newest Grudge that came out in... 2020 or 2019, one of the two. But before we get into uh, the movie, what tea are you drinking today, Jess? I went super southern today and just have sweet iced tea. Ooh. Tasty. Southern sweet, like get diabetes after one drink. Sweet. Oh. <laughs> My brother in law made it. <laughs> Very nice. A jelly. I have way too much tea, and I've been trying to get rid of the tea that I don't get excited about drinking. And so I've come up with the idea of combining flavors to see what happens. And I was doing like lemon tea and green tea, and naturally that went along pretty well. Well, today I'm trying a new flavor, so we will see how it goes. But I am using the Kroger green tea, which... It's pretty bitter, so I mixed it with the Rishi blueberry hibiscus tea. So we will see what happens. Because I didn't want to just have the blueberry hibiscus because I need caffeine. <laughs> but I couldn't just drink the green tea because I had originally bought that to make sweet tea with. But anyways, so. I tried the, the Target brand, the Market Pantry yeah, just, green tea. and So no. bitter very bitter as well yeah it's not the the greatest quality leaves yeah they just use the dregs from the the high quality tea so it tastes a lot more bitter and they burn really easily i've noticed burn oh god yeah i, I which releases more of a bitter flavor so. yeah so the grudge so for those who may not be familiar this movie is still directed by the original director of Juwan, which is uh, Takashi Shimizu. And we will get more into the in depth as far as like the similarities and the differences. But with this movie, it's about an American nurse that moved to Tokyo with her boyfriend. And because one of her coworkers didn't show up, to work for uh, this house, she is sent to that house to take care of the, the mother. And she is exposed to some supernatural activity, which you, it, it's very similar to Juwan, where they show different like stories, but it's a lot more overarching and connecting. Um, so you get to see, you know, what happened with the people that moved into the house, what happened to, Kayako and her son, and what happened to the sister of the people that moved into the house. But yeah, it's just Karen, the nurse, it's just her like trying to figure out what's going on and stuff. But anyways, so for entertainment, would you like me to go first or would you like to go first? You want to go, I'll first. go first. Because I know you're going to have way more to say <laughs> yeah. than I will. So I watched the movie. This is the first time I watched this version ever. So I don't have the nostalgia glasses this time around. <laughs> Usually it's me. But this time, she's the one with the nostalgia glasses. This is the first time viewing for me. Personally, I would give it a six. It's all right. But it's a little dated. Some of the scares and all are a little bit dated. Uh, they didn't give quite as much effort as I would have liked for a couple of things as well. And I know some of it might be a cultural kind of thing, 
but I expected just a little bit more from it. And I didn't get quite the overarching sense of dread as they could have given with this movie. So it didn't quite get there for me, but it was all right. We've definitely seen a lot worse. Um, This is just kind of the eh (laughs) one for me. They did a couple of things well, like the the attic scene, which, to be fair, was a little bit expected. <laughs> and the kid that you see, his um, him standing there as she's going up the elevator, and then he's closer. That was pretty decent. But overall, I, I feel like I had expected a little bit more, especially the way you were hyping it up, Alyssa. Sorry. <laughs> so it didn't quite live up to the hype. <laughs> For me. That's probably my fault. Darn it. Well, also, a couple of times during the movie, and of course we'll get to this in realism scale, you guys all know how I can be. <laughs> and when I call bull on something, it kind of ruins the the movie atmosphere for me. <laughs> so, there were a couple of things that I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Why? No. <laughs> and it just kind of wrecked it for me. The, I, I think though, funnily enough, the, the biggest thing that I was disappointed in didn't have anything to do with the realism, but it was with the effects. And that was when you see the ghost, I guess, of Yoko when she comes back to the, the care center and she turns around and you see just like this rubbery, like tongue. (laughs) <laughs> hanging down i'm sorry no i i could barely even chuckle at it like it's silly it's very silly when they had previously like a really good atmosphere with her kind of walking very creepy and all almost zombie like but and again i know this is probably a cultural thing where they don't really show much gore and all but in that instance Please put more effort into it. Just a little bit. Like, put just a bit more. She had her jaw ripped off. Have some viscera here. Have some, like, ligaments and tendons kind of hanging down and all. All, like, chunky kind of gory. Not, like, thick chunks. Just, you know, little, little bitty pieces and chunks here of gore and like skin hanging down and all from being shredded off of her maybe a tooth got stuck in here the tongue needs to be like ripped or shredded not whole in there she got her again her jaw was ripped off i really really doubt her tongue is completely intact so like do more (laughs) Yeah, because your your tongue is kind of connected to your jaw. Like, yeah, it's, yeah. it's got a, a piece that's connected to there. And it is fairly free in here. Like, you can swallow your tongue. That's one of the dangers of a seizure, a really bad seizure. But there's still areas where it's kind of connected. It has to be for us to be able to make certain sounds. So have parts of it torn and shredded. Like, it shouldn't all be intact. And it definitely wouldn't be rubbery looking. Do better. But that's my two cents. Your turn. (laughs) Well, so this movie, I have a lot of love for this movie. And the main reason is, I think I said this in the Halloween episode, but Halloween was the unintentional first scary movie that I ever saw but this was the first intentional scary movie that I ever or the the first scary movie that I intentionally watched and it it scarred me it scared me for a long time and even now there's certain things that creep me out that I feel like wouldn't creep me out as much if I hadn't to seen the movie and it hadn't I didn't see it at the time that I did but overall one thing that is a oh so as far as the scale goes because this is one of the movies that I watched over and over I mean it's because of this movie 
that I bought and watched you on. Um, I even bought the uh, director's cut of uh, The Grudge. And that, if you guys haven't seen the director's cut of The Grudge, you need to see it because that actually expands on the lore and makes it really interesting. Like, that's, that's one thing I like about this movie series is I really enjoy learning about the tragedy of the the ghosts. Um, it, but It would have made it a little bit better. I mean, I'm kind of sad we didn't watch that version, but this one was free on Prime. So Yeah, I, I think I still have a copy, so maybe we'll watch it together one time. Maybe. But, but anyways. <laughs> this one was just kind of... But uh, the strongest point of this movie, though, is it's very well put together. Um, there weren't, at least, there weren't any plot holes that I could tell as far as the convoluted story and how it's all pieced together. There wasn't any disconnect. They knew very solidly where in time each character was. Um, and I think part of the benefit is the fact that they had so many previous renditions of this story so they kind of picked and choose and they had enough experience that they knew what to do and i actually like this uh the, the way that they put together this movie a little bit better than the previous one because the previous one is like oh it'll tell the character's name and then it'd say the story and they all kind of interconnected but they also were very separate it was a little more disjointed in yeah. the previous one. this one did a better job connecting who the people were yeah. and why we should care yeah. who they were to each other. So they did do a little bit better on that. I feel like, though, in the original Juon, they had a lot more stuff in the background that I really liked and appreciated. And so this movie, I was kind of expecting more of that, and I kept looking in the background for different things. And there were a couple here and there, but they were very, very subtle for the few that they did have. Mm -hmm. And some of them, since we were streaming it, you could barely even tell that there was supposed to be something there. Yeah. So that fell a little bit short, too. Yeah, because there's the scene, which this scene I didn't even realize was in the movie until I had watched it, like, five or ten times. But whenever the detectives go and they end up finding the bodies of the homeowners, whenever they first go into the top of the stairs, in the background you see this pane of glass and you see Keiko um, come and her... You can see the white of her face in the middle and then whenever they leave, you can then see her going away. Um, and that really chilled me. But yeah, it's like if you were streaming it and you watched it... I can tell you, you probably wouldn't be able to tell what that was. Um, you might have thought it was a speck of uh, dust or whatever. But since I ha originally had the DVD of it, you could clearly, well, I wouldn't say clearly, but you could very easily tell that it was Keiko. You could make out more of the features. Yeah. Um, but one thing that I really enjoy this movie is about the tragedy of the characters. Like, these are normal people. They don't deserve the fate that they had. They simply walked into a house. And because of whatever happened in the house, it attached themselves to, um, attached itself to the people. And so I love the, the aspect of getting to know the characters, realizing that they're completely normal. But then, you know, they're put in this situation that is absolutely terrifying. But... <laughs> Yeah, it's like the. I love the story. I love the background of the ghosts and why they do what they do. But the scares definitely are like the setup of the scares, very good strong point of the movie. But it's the payoffs. It's kind of like 50 50, it, if not even less than that, because there's only a handful of times that the payoff is really good. Like the, the attic scene, it's like, yes, I know it's expected but at that time it's still good mm -hmm. you know at that time there really weren't a lot of movies that exploited addicts a whole lot and really didn't use them as a part of the scares more like oh a, a kind of creepy aspect but it was this scene in this movie that really catapulted and that that may have been why it felt dated to you but at that time i remember it was 
a, a new frontier of that type of scares. But yeah, the the attic scene, um, and then also the scene where you see how Peter discovered the bodies. I feel like that was a really good payoff scene. Um, as far as like, you know, he's hanging out with the child. He's just wandering around. You know, he just thinks that the parents are late. He doesn't really know what's going on. But then all of a sudden, body plops down and you see her just staring, you know, dead eyes into him like, ooh. And then he sees that the father hung himself. Like, I felt like that was pretty good. Um, but definitely the weakest or one of the weakest uh, scares in the movie is the Yoko scene, as you mentioned, and then the sister getting pulled into the bed like that. Like, I understand that they're trying to get at, oh, you're not safe anywhere. You're not even safe in your own bed. Like, I understand that. But the execution is just it was just silly silly to oh, me. No. What about the uh, Toshio leaning over the dude and you hear the, the cat noise? <laughs> oh yeah, and then he's like, ah! <laughs> and it just like freezes. Yeah, that's another one that's not... Yeah. It, no payoff there. Yeah, and it, like this movie's frustrating because it has so much going for it, but it's just those payoffs. Um, and then the last thing that I'll kind of mention is... It, I don't know how many of you have uh, watched Duan or The Grudge or how many of the movies you've seen. There's a lot. But this movie, I, one thing that I really like about this movie is, yes, it's considered an American remake, but it's really not a remake of Duan. Yes, it has a... There's one storyline that's very similar, but it's not... You can watch Juwan and then The Grudge, and they're they're two separate movies. It's like you see connecting pieces, but the scares, um, very few of them are are the used the same way. Um, the the characters are similar, but they're different enough that it doesn't feel like it's the same movie. I don't know. I just I felt like for doing an American remake of a foreign film. This is definitely the way to do it. So that way the audiences that already love the original film, they can still rewatch or the watch the American version and not feel like they're watching the exact same movie. And it is nice too that they were able to do that because it also adds an extra element to mm -hmm. the movie of these people have left the area that they know and are comfortable with. And they're now in a country that they don't know the language that well or at all. We'll get to that later. Or they don't know the area. They get lost very easily or turned around very easily. They don't mm -hmm. understand the culture. It's very, very different from our own. So they're already out of their comfort zone and out of their element. And they're just trying to find their their footing and their heading. And then this happens. Yeah. And now they're just like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> What's mm -hmm. going on? So yeah. That, that is kind of nice there. They did that pretty well. Yeah, it adds an, an extra element of Creep Fractor. And I forgot if I mentioned this in the original Juwan uh, podcast episode that we covered. I'm sure I did. But the whole Kayako and then Toshio and um, the cat spirit, like this is based off of Japanese lore. Um, like, the whole, whenever he gets killed, it's very well est established that there's mythos in Japan where this there's this uh, cat demon that kind of combines with this boy. And um, I know, I can't remember exactly how Keiko's involved in that lore. I feel kind of bad that I, we should have looked it up now that I think about it. I'm sorry, guys. But I, I just... Really we're tired. I just love how drenched in Japanese culture this movie and story is. And, I mean, I guess a lot of... I don't know. I feel like in some American films you get that, but it's not... And I love... Uh, I don't know. It's just you don't really 
get a lot of movies, either American or foreign, that are as drenched in and as established in culture as uh, this movie and story is, which I think is partially why it became so popular, um, because it was something people was were familiar with, and um, bringing it to the screen kind of made it all the more terrifying. But and that's hard to do in other movies, which is probably why they don't do it very often. Yeah. But that's that's all I had to say on the entertainment. Did you have anything else? Or are you good for realism? No, we can go ahead and move on to realism. I know we have a lot of points there. Shall I go first? <laughs> so you're going to probably nitpick more than me. <laughs> I don't feel like there's that much to nitpick, to be perfectly honest. I would actually probably give this one about a four. I feel like most of the reactions were fairly solid. They're very confused. They don't know what's going on. And yeah. the biggest things that I'm going to harp on, though, are like the wife of the guy that moved there for his job with the, the mother. Yeah. She had to have known. Like, it's not a sudden, oh, hey, by the way, we're moving to Japan today kind of thing. It's yeah. You literally can't do that. <laughs> yeah. It's a process. It is definitely a process. So she would have had time. And I know, I know moving is an ordeal. It is time consuming and it is an ordeal. We are still finishing up cleaning the house. Like we're not done yet. It's been a couple weeks, but we're still not done. There's a lot to do. But there's also some downtime here and there. And if you know you're going to be in a foreign country where their first language is definitely for sure not even close to English, maybe learn some phrases that you know you're probably going to need. Yeah. At least the basics, enough to get you by, maybe a couple of things for directions. So if you get turned around and can't figure out how to get back to where you were, you can stop someone and ask hey, which direction do I go for this? <laughs> and you understand, you know, at least, you know, left, right, go down this way. <laughs> yeah. Something, just enough of the basics to get you by. I can completely understand not knowing how to read it because that is a whole other beast in and of itself. Yeah. It really is. But at least talking, <laughs> To the people around you and maybe yeah. look up a bit of their culture and because they're very different, they have different customs and things there and they're not, at least from what I've seen and heard, very big on small talk unless you know them. <laughs> so they're very friendly and very helpful and they don't mind, you know, pointing you in the right direction and all, but they're not going to stop and, and ask you, are you Okay. Where are you heading? Oh, that sounds fun. No, they're going to be like, it's down here. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no enough to, to get by is what we're saying. She didn't know anything. She like expected people to know English and all. She got lost and was like, nobody spoke English. It was horrible. Welcome to Japan. <laughs> Learn the language. <laughs> like, Yeah. And I feel like. Like, we were talking about this uh, before we started recording on, in Japan, it is required that you learn English, but, you know, that the average person, if they're not constantly utilizing English, it's like, yes, in Japan, they tend to, for, for a country that doesn't speak native English, they actually have quite a few... Um, English words and phrases just kind of scattered throughout their their cities and culture and stuff like that. But it's like it it's just like if you live in America and you live near a city where um, a lot of people speak Spanish, it's like you're going to be able to pick up a word here and there. You're going to understand basic phrases, but it's not like you necessarily retain enough to have a full-on conversation and so unless if you know they are constantly practicing after they got out of school and stuff like that then they the majority of people might be able to vaguely help you but they wouldn't probably be able to uh, help a whole lot there's there's definitely going to be a huge language barrier and it's it's just like over here i mean they 
a lot of schools request that you take at least two years of a language course. I know I took three years of Spanish, but I retained maybe a handful of phrases. Yeah. And a spattering of words. <laughs> like there's, I would not be able to carry on an actual conversation. I do feel like retention in Japan is probably a little bit better just with the amount of English that they are supposed to learn. And as, um, as well as like the amount that English comes back up because it, they also have, you know, American films that go to Japan. I mean, of, often they're dubbed over, but, um, but yeah, the whole, I, I didn't really picture you can, um, I don't know what your impression of the wife was, but I didn't really picture her as stuck up. But whenever someone doesn't even try and learn the very basics of the language, because, yeah, it's like when you when you are transferring because of the job, they give you a decent amount of notice, especially if you're moving to a foreign country. So not only did she probably have months to try and learn the language a little bit, but she also had a pretty long airplane ride to Japan. She could have just popped in, you know, at, at the time, maybe Rosetta Stone or whatever the hell she had available, but at least learn something. Just, I don't know. It just seemed kind of a very stupid um, decision on her part. And whenever she's like, oh, I got lost, I, I don't feel bad for her at all. Nope. Zero sympathy. <laughs> None whatsoever. I do also take issue with the fact that when Peter finds out about the bodies and everything and, and sees them, he doesn't call the police, like, ever. He just runs out. I can understand if he didn't realize that she was in the photos in the background of, like, oh, every God. photo That's ever. <laughs> I can understand him getting those letters and thinking, I want to try to put a stop to this myself before involving the authorities or anyone just to see if I can take care of it, you know, under the table and, and not have to worry anyone or bother anyone with it. I can understand that. But when you see a body, well, first off, he sees a kid that's been beaten all the heck and doesn't call the authorities about yeah. it. Then he finds the bodies and still doesn't call anyone. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm calling foul. Flag on the play. <laughs> no. Yeah. So those are the, the main things that I take issue with. Well, so I know I'm not as nitpicky on the realism. And I feel fairly confident that my nostalgia glasses aren't on for the realism scale. But I'm going to give it a five. So just, you know, one of a stop. That's not like I feel like that. My you, you sure you don't have the nostalgia glasses on? I, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh in addition to your points, like your your points were the same ones that I had. The only additional thing that I have to add, which is really because of the fact that it's supposed to be an American film is way too many people were speaking fluent, clear English. And like the, the, the policemen, I don't know. It's, I, I can't picture them being into contact with too many people that speak English. I don't know. I, I just felt like it was a little bit too convenient to have all of these characters that spoke very well English. I don't know. I feel like I could understand the policeman understanding it and speaking it fairly well. I feel like it should have been a bit more broken, but I feel like he would probably be one of the ones to use it the most. Just because of the variety of people that he probably deals with. And he's in a, an area, Tokyo, that is very big in the tourist trade. Like, that's when you think of Japan, that's one of the first cities you think of. Mm -hmm. And and actually, the, the man that plays the detective, 
oh, I'm I'm so sorry if I butcher his name, Ryo Ishibashi. Um, he he actually is. Well, I wouldn't. I can't. I don't know so much about him that I'd say he's a very well known actor in Japan. But he's he's a established Japanese actor in Japan. So I don't know if he really did speak English that well, or if he had, you know, voice coaching or anything like that to make the conversation seem like it flowed smoother. Like, I can understand the reason why they weren't like, oh, let's allow them to have more broken English or have kind of a language barrier. They wanted to make sure that the conversation flowed well. And but, were understood by the audience. Yeah, but I did think it was really cool. Like the the actress that plays Keiko, she's been in all of the the Grudge movies from the original Japanese to the American rendition. Like I think that's really cool. And then the fact that they added these, um, you know, known Japanese actors in an American film. I thought that was pretty pretty neat and the fact that you know they weren't side characters they were you know a part of the main cast and engaging a lot with the american cast i i really like that mixture i think it's really important to kind of have movies that mesh together like that so it's it's really nice especially if you want to kind of dip your toes in another culture's um, horror genre this is a good breakout kind of film to watch yeah they don't have too many subtitles for the foreign language so it's not like you're reading the entire movie i know some people hate that but this is a good happy medium point this is a great movie as an intro to asian horror now like the american ring i would normally say that but since it's so different from ringu The Ring is if you like the idea of the movie, but you just want to like dip your toes in. But The Grudge is like, yes, I want to kind of get into Japanese horror, but I don't know if I'm comfortable yet about reading subtitles or whatever. Because who's going to watch the dub of those (laughs) those movies? They're normally pretty bad. (laughs) Dubs are almost always horrible. I know. I never watch them. I can't. I just no. know. No, anime is one thing. Watching a dub of an anime is very different from watching a live action. Yeah. Because uh, I feel like, because there's been scenes where I feel like the original actor portrays a different emotion than the the dub actor. And, you know, they, they can't be in each other's head. So, obviously, the, the person who's dubbing can only go on inference of the scene and what they think that that actor's emotions are. But guys, if, if you haven't jumped into Japanese horror or honestly, any sort of like Asian horror or foreign horror in general, it's okay to read subtitles. Don't read, don't watch the dub. It's, it's different. Honestly, no one does horror movies like Asians do horror movies. Yeah. I mean, that's why, that's why we have an Asian horror month. Yes. I can't wait to get to that point again. So, but that's all I had on the the realism. Did you have anything else? No, the only thing I don't, I don't feel like this is a political conversation, but I feel like this is kind of an appropriate movie to do at this time for all of the hate crimes against the Asian community. We just want to give our support and let the community know that we are with you. We stand behind you. You know, we just have love and support and we wish everyone, you know, and with any possibility of facing a situation like that can stay safe. Absolutely. But I I also feel like, you know, the the more that we integrate uh, different cultures, it creates a less sense of naivety and stupidity (laughs) towards one can hope yeah a lot of it i think is just born of ignorance yeah for sure but that's why like i love foreign films because it does help knock down at least some of those walls of ignorance i don't think it's possible to 100 percent knock them down because we don't live that life we don't 
we don't live the same experience that they do, but I feel like it's a, a great first step for sure. Absolutely. But let let us know what you guys thought of the movie. I know there's a few people that, well, quite a few people that think it's stupid. It's kind of like, it's like you either love the grudge or you hate it or you're just kind of like, eh. And let us know if you've seen Juwan, do you like the original Juwan or do you like the American remake? Um, I feel like this is one of those perfect comparisons since it's by the same director. Uh, you can really see. I I feel like he improved a lot on his technique. Oh, and one thing that I completely forgot to mention on the entertainment scale that I'll add right quick. We're wrapping up, I swear. <laughs> Is I love how in the original Juwan, whenever Kayako comes down the stairs, it's very sorrowful. Like she's she she's not really doing the ah noise it's more like a groaning like she's in pain and like you feel sorry for her as she's coming down the stairs like terrified but sorry because you understand the tragedy of uh, her death while this one it's a lot more creepy like yes you understand the tragedy of how she died and the horrible situation but I guess because she had the weird obsession with Peter and I don't know, it's just a different feel. It's a lot creepier, even though I feel bad for her. So I don't know. It's a, a really weird combination. Um, but it's like, I like both of the movies because of those different tones that they give with uh, Keiko. Um, but yeah. Anyways. So let us know what you guys think about this movie, which one you liked better, uh, or if you're like me, where you like certain elements of each movie better, and if they could combine it, that would be amazing. But <laughs> if there are any other movies that you want us to watch and review, please let us know in the comments or send us a message. We always love those as well. And in the meantime, guys, stay safe and stay spooky. Bye. Uh...